Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. If this is your first time here, and you're somebody who enjoys listening to horror stories, you should join us by clicking subscribe down below. I upload every single evening. Please leave a like on today's video before we get started. I never thought buying a couch off Craigslist would lead me down a path of terror and fear. It all started when my eight-year-old daughter Bonnie decided to use our couch as a trampoline. Of course, the springs couldn't handle her energetic jumps and broke, leaving us with a lumpy and uncomfortable piece of furniture. Desperate for a new couch, I turned to Craigslist in hopes of finding a cheap and decent replacement. After scrolling through countless listings, I finally came across a post that caught my eye. It was an old, not very good looking couch, but it seemed in good enough condition and at an unbelievably low price. Without hesitation, I contacted the seller and arranged to pick it up the next day. The address given to me was in a secluded area far from the city. I remember feeling a bit uneasy as I drove down a long winding road to their house. It was surrounded by dense woods, and the only sound I could hear was the crunch of gravel under my tires. As I pulled up to the house, I couldn't help but feel a sense of foreboding. The house was old and dilapidated. It was old so old. It seemed like no one had lived there for years, and we're talking hundreds of years. I took a deep breath and reminded myself that I was just here to pick up a couch. I walked up to the door and knocked on it. After a few moments, it creaked open. A middle-aged man stood in the doorway, his eyes sizing me up. He didn't say a word, just pointed towards the living room where the couch was. Feeling a bit uncomfortable, I made my way inside. The interior of the house was just as creepy as the exterior. The walls were covered in old, peeling and moldy wallpaper, and the furniture was old and covered in dust. I couldn't help but wonder who lived in this strange and isolated place. The man led me to the living room, where the couch was waiting. It was not too bad, I have to admit, it looked like he had cleaned it up and made it a bit more presentable for me. The couch was the cleanest and newest looking thing in this entire house. It was a deep red velvet with an ornate wooden frame. I couldn't believe my luck. It wasn't too bad, and after all, I was here now. I just had to figure a way of getting it into my truck. As I inspected the couch, the man decided to speak. You like it? His voice was gruff and cold, sending shivers down my spine. I nodded, trying to hide my unease. He then went on to tell me that the couch belonged to his late grandmother and that he was selling it to make room for new furniture. He seemed to be in a hurry to get rid of it, which I found odd, but I didn't dwell on it too much as I was eager to get the couch home and get rid of all our old, broken couch that my daughter had fucked up. After paying the man and loading the couch into my truck, I drove back home. Bonnie was ecstatic to see the new addition to our living room. I made a point to say no jumping on the couch. The last thing I wanted was to have to go back out and buy a new one all over again just because Bonnie can't control her ADHD and excitement. We spent the rest of the afternoon rearranging furniture to make room for the new couch. However, as we were moving the couch, I noticed something strange. On one of the corners, there were small, dark stains that looked like dried blood. My heart skipped a beat, and I felt a sense of dread wash over me. I quickly dismissed the thought and told myself that it was probably just a stain from something else, like sauce, paint, etc. 
I decided to deep clean the couch with some heavy duty chemicals just to be safe. After a few hours of scrubbing and spraying, the stains were completely gone and the couch looked just about as good as new. For a while, everything was fine. Bonnie and I enjoyed our new couch, and I pushed a strange encounter at the isolated house to the back of my mind. But then, strange things started to happen. At night, I would hear strange noises coming from the living room. It sounded like someone was walking or shuffling around on the couch, at first, I thought it was just my imagination, but then I started to notice that the couch would sometimes be in a different position than how I left it. Now Bonnie being eight definitely isn't strong enough to move that couch. However, one night I woke up to find Bonnie standing in the living room staring at the couch with a blank expression on her face. When I asked her what she was doing, she simply replied, The lady on the couch wants to play with me. I was immediately filled with a sense of dread. What the fuck was my daughter talking about? I tried to brush it off as just childish imagination, but I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was seriously wrong here. As the days went by, my unease turned into full-blown fear. I started having nightmares about the couch, and I could swear that I saw shadows moving around it when I was alone in the house. One night, I woke up to find Bonnie sleepwalking towards the living room. I followed her and found her standing in front of the couch, her eyes closed, her small hands reaching out towards it. I tried to wake her, but she wouldn't budge. It was like she was in some sort of trance. That was a final straw for me. I knew I had to get rid of that couch, no matter how much Bonnie loved it. I didn't want to take any chances with our safety. The next day, I went back to the isolated house to confront the man who sold me the couch. I needed closure. I needed answers. I demanded to know the truth about it. And after some hesitation, he finally told me the horrifying story. The couch did belong to his late grandmother, but she wasn't a sweet old lady like he claimed. She was a twisted and deranged woman who used the couch to do weird stuff. The stains on the corner of the couch were indeed dried blood from her sacrifices. The man's family had always been wary of the couch, thought it was cursed, and wanted to get rid of it, but his grandmother had a hold on them even after her death. He had no idea why she chose to sell the couch to a stranger, but he was glad to get rid of it. Shaken and horrified, I immediately took the couch out into our yard and started burning it. I didn't want to risk anyone else falling under this curse. I didn't even believe in curses up until this point. After that, the strange occurrences in our house stopped, and Bonnie stopped sleepwalking and went back to her normal self. To this day, I still shudder at the thought of what could have happened if I hadn't have got rid of that couch. It makes sense now. The man who sold me the couch didn't want to say a single word to me because he had already been through what we went through weeks later. The thought of bringing something so evil into my home still haunts me, and I will never trust a Craigslist purchase again. I should have listened to my gut when it told me something was off about the man I was trading cars with. But I was desperate. I needed to get rid of my old car before it completely fell apart. So I ignored the warning signs and went ahead with the swap. It all started when I posted an ad on Craigslist 
looking to trade my old car for a newer model. I couldn't afford to buy a new car outright, but I was hoping to find someone who was willing to trade with me. That's when I received a message from a man named Jack. He said that his car was looking to get rid of itself. In other words, he didn't want his anymore. And he asked me if I was interested in doing the trade. We exchanged a few messages and everything seemed normal. He seemed like a nice guy and his car looked like it was relatively new, in pretty good condition. We agreed to meet in a parking lot the next day to do the swap. I arrived at the parking lot early, eager to get rid of my old beat up car and drive away in something newer. Jack arrived a few minutes later. We exchanged pleasantries before getting down to business. As we inspected each other's car, I couldn't help but feel a sense of guilt. I was paying this guy cash on top of doing the swap, but something just felt bad. It felt like I was stealing from him. On top of that, there just was something not right about this Jack guy. His smile seemed forced and fake, and his eyes had a strange intensity to them. I just put it to the back of my mind, thinking it was just my nerves, and I was probably overanalyzing everything. We completed the swap, and I drove away in Jack's car, feeling excited about the upgrade. But as I drove, I couldn't shake off the feeling that something wasn't right. The car seemed to have a mind of its own, veering off course and making strange noises. The steering was completely out, and if you don't turn the wheel to the left, it just starts to drive to the right, without me instructing it to. I shrugged it off, thinking it was just new tyres, or new car jitters. But, as I pulled into my driveway, the car suddenly came to a screeching halt, and the engine died. I was frustrated and angry. I'd been so excited about my new car, and now it had broken down on the first day. I called Jack, hoping he would help me with the car, but he didn't answer. I left him a voicemail and tried to calm myself down, thinking that maybe it was just a minor issue. But, as the days went by, the car's problems only seemed to worsen. It would randomly turn off while I was driving. Strange warning symbols would appear on the dashboard. Eventually I took it to a mechanic, but they couldn't find anything wrong with it. They said that there was something wrong with the electrical unit, and that it had nothing to do with the mechanical side. I tried to contact Jack again, but he never responded. I even went back to the parking lot where we did the swap, but there was no sign of him or the old car. It was like he had just vanished into thin air. I was starting to get scared, but I didn't know what to do. I was stuck with this damn car, and it was starting to affect my daily life. I couldn't go anywhere without the fear of the car breaking down or causing an accident. I needed to get rid of this car, no matter what the cost. I tried selling it, but no one seemed to be interested. I even tried giving it away for way lower than what the price is worth, but no one was contacting me. It was like the car was cursed, and no one wanted to be near it. I was at my wit's end, and I didn't know what else to do. That's when finally, I received a return call from Jack, weeks later. He was laughing on the other end, taunting me, saying that I was a fool for trading cars with him. He told me that the whole time, the car was broken, but now it was mine. I couldn't tell if he was high, drunk, or just completely off his head. I was terrified. I thought he was trying to scare me, or to get back at me for something. Then I remembered, the strange symbols on the dashboard of the car. It turns out that there was something wrong with the electrics. 
He had sold it to me willingly knowing that. But still, I was trying to get rid of the car again, but no one would take it. I took it to an electrical specialist, who took a look and said the wiring had all been disconnected. It had been reconnected with aftermarket parts, parts that didn't fit, and, as a result, caused the car to be faulty. He quoted me 800 bucks for the job. I don't even have 800 bucks in my bank. I couldn't do it. This car's curse was spreading to my life, and I couldn't actually believe it. I received another call from Jack, but this time, his voice was frantic and scared. He told me that I deserved the car because I'd worked so hard. I didn't know what else to do, because after all this, I think the guy was just nuts. I didn't know where he lived, and every time I tried asking him during these crazy calls he'd do with me, he would never give me an answer. He seemed to only ever call me whenever he was drunk or doing hardcore drugs. I didn't really start answering anymore. I started ignoring him, until eventually I outright blocked him. The car continued to have issues every single day, until it got so bad that somehow my blinkers and headlights were starting to fault. At that point, it becomes completely illegal, and you just can't drive the car at night. Well, blinkers are needed during the day also. I was quite lucky in the sense that I never got pulled over by the police for not having blinkers for a whole three months. Eventually, I sold the car for around 20% of what I paid for it. Yeah, that's the biggest hit I ever took in my whole life, was that fucking car that I bought off Craigslist. Huh, <laughs> never again. I just moved into my new apartment in the city. I was about to start my new job in a few weeks. The only downside was that the previous tenant had left the place in a complete mess. That's what you get when renting one of the cheapest flats slash apartments in the whole city. The landlord was clearly useless. When I brought it up with him, he didn't even reply for a whole four days. I started trying to clean it myself, but with boxes to unpack and furniture to assemble, I didn't have much time. That's when I decided to look for a cleaning service on Craigslist. Some of the people on there were offering a full day of cleaning for only 30 or 40 bucks. I figured I'd only need one day, and that would get the whole apartment in a pretty decent shape. I found a listing for a local cleaning company that had pretty decent reviews and affordable prices. I contacted them, and they were able to schedule a cleaning for the next day. I was relieved and excited to have someone else take care of all this mess. The next morning, I woke up to a knock on my door. It was a cleaner's, a woman named Maria, and her two assistants, Sarah and Rachel. They were friendly and professional and I showed them around the apartment, pointing out the areas that needed most attention. As they got to work, I went about my day, running around and unpacking all my stuff, but as the hours passed, I couldn't understand. I couldn't quite put my finger on this feeling, but something just didn't sit right with me. I think I was nervous, stressed, and just completely exhausted from moving into this new place. As the day turned into evening, I noticed that the cleaning service was taking an unusually long time. I figured this was probably a tactic of theirs to get more days pay out of me. I checked in on them, and saw that they were still working only on the living room. The living room was the first room they started cleaning. I thought to myself, they must be doing a thorough job, but the uneasiness in my gut only grew stronger. 
I decided to make myself some dinner, and offered to make some for the cleaning crew as well. They declined, saying that they had bought their own food. Well, I went back into the kitchen, but something just didn't feel right about this whole thing. As the night went on, I heard strange noises coming from the living room. It sounded like someone was dragging furniture across the floor. I peeked out of my bedroom and saw that the cleaning crew had moved all the furniture to one side of the room. I thought it was odd, but I assumed they were just deep cleaning the carpet or going to extra lengths. But, as I went to bed that night, I felt like I was being watched. I tried to brush it off as just my imagination, but something just wasn't right. The next morning, I woke up to find the cleaning crew had left absolutely nothing. My apartment looked spotless. I was relieved and went about my day. There was no mess anywhere, and they'd actually done a good job. However, as I was getting ready for work, I noticed something strange. The furniture in the living room was back in its original place. I brushed it off as just a mistake on my part. Maybe I'd imagined them moving it the day before, and it was all just in my mind, or a dream from the night before. But as the days went by, I started noticing more strange things happening. Objects would go missing, I would hear footsteps and voices when I was home alone, and I would wake up to find my bedroom door open, even though I always made sure to lock it before going to bed. I started to become paranoid, thinking that someone had broken into my apartment. I called the landlord to change the locks, but he assured me that no one else had a key besides me, and that I wasn't allowed to change the lock. I couldn't explain the strange occurrences, and I started to fear for my safety. One day, I came home to find a note on my door. It was from Maria, the head of the cleaning crew. She apologized for any inconvenience, and said that she and her team would no longer be able to provide their services to me. I was confused, and called her to ask why but she refused to give me an explanation. Feeling frustrated and alone, I decided to take matters into my own hands. I started setting up security cameras in my apartment, hoping to catch whoever was responsible for what was actually happening. The cameras cost me around 200 bucks, which was a lot of money, but I was genuinely thinking that I was either one, losing my mind, or two, being burgled every single night by someone that either had a key or had broken in. Every morning I'd wake up, there'd be no signs of a break-in anywhere. The apartment has no windows and the airflow is regulated by air conditioning. The door would never be broken, it never had any signs of break-ins, so what was it? Well, I was about to find out. I decided to fit hidden secret cameras in every room of my apartment and put my doubts to bed as if it really was a haunted apartment then I would just leave not that I actually believed any of that shit anyway for the first week nothing happened and voila I didn't even wake up at all which was a bit of a surprise on the second week however I started waking up again in the middle of the night to the same noises footsteps, doors opening and closing, and even the toilet flushing. On that very night, I got straight up and turned all the lights on. I went straight onto my computer, which connects Wi-Fi wireless to all the cameras in each room of the apartment. When I turned them on and checked the camera's history, what I saw shocked me to my core. Maria, the head cleaning lady, walks in through the door, goes to my bathroom, uses it, flushes the bathroom, and then quickly runs out. She didn't steal anything, she didn't take anything, but for a few seconds, she did look in one of the cupboards in the kitchen. The most terrifying part of it all 
she had a key to get into my apartment, and I had no idea how. The only reasonable explanation for this is that before I fitted the cameras, and on the first day that Maria and her team came to clean, she took my key, got an imprint, and had a key cut. This is really the only explanation that I came up with with the cops. When they went searching for Maria, she didn't get found. She never came back to the apartment, and it's like she knew that we were after her. That's also terrifying as fuck. I don't know if she has connections to my landlord, but my landlord also found out about this, and was involved with the cops, giving information and details. Above all, I actually got in trouble for having hidden cameras in my own apartment. Obviously the cops asked how I had this evidence, and how I knew without a shadow of a doubt that it was Maria. When they asked me this, I showed them the videos of her using the toilet, walking and looking at the cupboards, and then leaving. But by far the best evidence is her using a key to get into the property, opening the door, leaving it slightly ajar behind her, and walking straight to the toilet. I paid her in cash, so there was no history of transactions or any connections to her real name or address. She was never seen in that apartment complex ever again. This whole story creeps the fuck out of me, and to this day, after moving twice, I have cameras in every room forever. Call me traumatized, call me paranoid, but... I can't help it. It's just how I am, and it's all because of what happened with me and that cleaning team off Craigslist. As I wake up to the sound of my alarm, I feel a sense of pure pain wash over me. Emotional pain. It's Monday morning, which means I have to leave my three-year-old daughter, Lily, at daycare. As a single mum who works full-time, this has become a routine for us, but it doesn't make it any easier. I get out of bed and go through my morning routine trying my best to keep my emotions in check. I know Lily can sense when I'm upset, and I don't want her to start her day off on a negative note. I make her breakfast, get her dressed, and pack her back for daycare. As we make our way out of the door, I can feel tears starting well up in my eyes. Being a single mum is hard enough, but the added stress of having to leave my little girl at daycare every day is almost unbearable. I constantly worry if she's happy, if she's being taken care of, and if she misses me as much as I miss her. I have to work to provide for us, and daycare is the only option for now. I drop Lily off at the daycare centre, trying my best to hold back my tears. She gives me a hug and a kiss before running off to play with her new friends. I watch her for a few minutes, making sure she's settled in, before reluctantly leaving for work. As I sit at my desk, I can't help but think about her. I miss her so much already. The guilt of leaving her at daycare eats away at me. But I have to focus on my work, so I try my best to push through those thoughts, and focus on my tasks for the day. But that focus is short-lived when I receive a call from the daycare centre. My heart drops as I answer, fearing the worst. The director informs me that Lily has been kicked out of the daycare for hurting the other kids. My heart sinks even further as I listen to the details. Apparently, Lily had been acting out, got into a fight with someone else in the daycare, the staff had tried to work with her and redirect her anger slash behaviour, but it had only gotten worse. 
they had no choice but to ask us to find an alternate care for her. I'm devastated. Not only am I stressed about finding a new daycare for Lily, but I'm disgusted that she would do something like this. She was too young to even explain herself. I was going to ask her why she did it, but she definitely wouldn't remember. I made sure to know that I was angry with her. I took her home, and when I did, I made sure to take away her iPad, and also not let her have her treats that evening. I also felt like a failure as a parent. I should have noticed something was wrong. I should have been able to prevent this from happening. But I was so caught up in trying to provide for us, that I didn't see the signs. I rushed to pick Lily up from the daycare, my mind racing with thoughts and emotions. As I walk into the centre, I see Lily sitting in a corner, tears streaming down her face. My heart breaks into a million pieces. I scoop her up into my arms and hold her tightly, trying my best not to cry in front of her. On the drive home, I try to talk to Lily about what happened in daycare, but she's only three years old, and she just doesn't fully understand. All she knows is that she's not going back to her friends and teachers, and that thought breaks her heart as much as it breaks mine. The next few days were a scramble to find a new daycare for Lily. I spent countless hours researching and calling different centres, trying to find one that will accept a kid who has been kicked out of another daycare. It's not an easy task, and I feel like I'm hitting dead ends at every turn, but I didn't feel like lying to them, or just not telling them that what had happened to Lily was obvious. She had been kicked out, and I just felt the need to let them know that. Finally, after days of searching, I found a daycare that was willing to take Lily. They understood the situation, and assured me that they had experience with kids who had behavioural issues. I was relieved and grateful, but at the same time, I still felt guilty and sad. As I dropped Lily off at her new daycare, I felt anxious. I was worried that she would have a hard time adjusting, and that she would act out again, and will be back to square one. But I have no other choice. I have to trust that this new daycare will be able to provide the care and attention that Lily needs. The first few days at the new daycare were tough. Lily cries every time I drop her off, and it takes all my willpower not to cry with her. I feel like I'm abandoning her, and it breaks my heart, but I know that I have to keep going, for both of our sakes. As the weeks go by, I start to see a change in Lily's behaviour. She's no longer acting out, and the teachers at the daycare have nothing but positive things to say about her. I was relieved and grateful that she had found a place where she could actually thrive. But that feeling of relief was short-lived when I received another call from the daycare. Lily had gotten into another fight with one of the other kids, and they were concerned about her aggressive behaviour. I feel like I'm back to square one, and the guilt and sadness came rushing back. I pick up Lily from daycare, and this time she's the one crying. She tells me the other child had hit her toy and taken it away. She got upset and hit them as a result. This time, she was actually more vocal about the whole incident, which was better. It meant that we could learn from it. I explained to her that hitting someone is not the right way to handle things, but I could see the confusion and frustration in her eyes as I tried to explain it in the most simplest words. I'm at a loss. I don't know what to do to help Lily. I feel like I'm failing as her parent, and the wave of it all is starting to take a toll on me. I'm constantly stressed and anxious, and I can feel the weight of the world on my shoulders. But then, something unexpected happens. Lily's teacher at the daycare pulls me aside and tries to tell me that she's going to give her a warning. Well, at the end of this all, 
I thought that this was her third chance, but it turns out that even after trying to leave work early, work around a new timetable slash schedule, she still was acting out. It was difficult, and after all this, she ended up getting pulled out of her second daycare. The problem was I had no choice. Working full time to maintain the rent and bills, I couldn't simply take her to work or quit my job, because either way, it just wouldn't work. It's not easy being a single mum and working full time. But I've learned that my daughter's well-being is more important than anything else. I have to make sacrifices and find a balance between work and spending time with her. As the weeks go by, Lily's behaviour sometimes was up and down. It was bad, but I immediately realised that something wasn't right. We started to get some therapists to come to the house and see how she was. Overall, it was something that I realised she needed to work on. She had a behavioural issue, but she hadn't been diagnosed yet. They mentioned about her hitting and pushing other kids. I was horrified. This wasn't the Lily I knew. I tried to reason with them, explaining that she was going through a phase and that we could work out a behaviour at home. But none of the daycares would allow it. They were adamant that she could no longer attend their system. Feeling defeated and overwhelmed, I went home and started searching for a third daycare. I asked for recommendations from friends and searched online, but nothing seemed to fit our needs. Most daycares had long waiting lists, or were too far from our home. I was starting to lose hope. That's when I started looking on Craigslist. I looked for a private babysitter, to start with. I wanted one that ran their own daycare from their home. The name of the sitter I came across was Mrs. Johnson. Her post was saying that she had years of experience and the personalised care she provided for each child was exceptional. She had diplomas, degrees and all her qualifications were shown up in badges, certificates and photos on the wall. I was intrigued and decided to give her a call. Mrs Johnson answered the phone with a cheery voice. We scheduled a meeting for the next day. I went down to her house, and I was pleasantly surprised. The daycare was really clean, smelt fantastic, and looked well maintained. Mrs Johnson seemed warm and caring. She showed us around her playroom and her outdoor play area, which were both well equipped with toys and activities for kids. We were impressed and decided to enroll Lily in Mrs Johnson's daycare. Lily seemed happy and excited to start at her new daycare. I felt relieved that we had finally found a suitable place for her. But things took a turn for the worse after a few weeks. Lily started coming home with bruises and scrapes. At first I thought it was just normal playtime accidents, but then I noticed that she seemed scared and anxious whenever it was time to go to daycare. I tried talking to Mrs Johnson about it, but she brushed it off, saying that the kids will be kids and accidents happen. I couldn't shake off the feeling that something just wasn't right here. Lily's behaviour also started to change. She became withdrawn and quiet, which was completely unlike her bubbly and outgoing personality. I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know what to do. One day, I received a call from Mrs Johnson. She was no longer cheery and happy. Instead, this time she was frantic and told me that Lily had gone missing. My heart dropped. I rushed to her house, speeding the whole way, fearing the worst. When I arrived, I saw police cars and worried parents gathered in front of Mrs Johnson's daycare. I was in a panic. My mind was racing with all the kinds of terrible scenarios. I frantically asked Mrs Johnson what had happened and she told me that she had been busy with a phone call and had lost track of the kids. What the fuck? How's that an excuse? Lily had somehow managed to sneak out of the house and was found wandering on the streets by a neighbour who called the police. 
I was beyond furious and relieved at the same time. I grabbed Lily and stormed out of Mrs. Johnson's daycare, never looking back. I felt like a terrible mother for putting my daughter in such a dangerous situation. I couldn't believe that I had trusted Mrs. Johnson with Lily's safety. I immediately filed a complaint with the authorities, but unfortunately, there wasn't enough evidence to press charges. Mrs. Johnson's daycare is still running, but I don't think it should be. After the incident, I decided to quit my job and stay home with Lily. I somehow started to work from home. I did freelance work. And on top of that, my parents started sending me some money to help me out to start with. In the end, things did work out. I couldn't bear to leave her in someone else's care ever again. Enough was enough. It was a tough decision, but I knew it was the best for my daughter. Months went by and Lily and I had settled into a routine. I was able to spend more time with her and watch her grow. However, I still felt guilty and I felt a fear of trusting someone else with Lily's care, even people in my own family. One day, while browsing through Craigslist, I came across a different private babysitter. The post mentioned that this lady was a mother of two and had recently started her own daycare from her home. I was hesitant at first, but something about her caught my attention. I decided to give her a call, and we scheduled a meeting for the next day. When I arrived at her house, it was pretty nice. It was boiling hot, as she had the heating way too high. She showed me around. I noticed that while I was there, there were a handful but only a handful of children in her daycare, which was a relief, especially after what I'd just been through. I decided to finally jump in the deep end. Working on Fiverr wasn't paying enough, and mum and dad weren't willing to fork out another 500 to cover the bills. I decided to enrol Lily in this new daycare. She seemed happy and excited to start. The first few weeks went by smoothly. Lily seemed happy, and was making new friends. But I did start to see more red flags. Overall, Lily stayed in this daycare, and thankfully, never got into any more red fights. She never came back with red skin, red bruises, or any other kinds of red, giving me red faces, with anger and embarrassment, escaping the damn daycare. This will be a memory for the rest of my life. Lily was a problem child, She grew up to be a bit of a brat, but as a whole, I love her. She's now 12 years old. She still has a behavioural issue, but thank God she's now in school. The teachers there know her well. They know how to deal with her, how to handle her outbursts and her tantrums. And as a whole, I trust the school way better than private daycares. Looking on Craigslist probably wasn't the best idea when it came to daycares and taking care of Lily but back then I didn't really know what to do, and my parents, being traditional, were also clueless. I was raised by my mum, who didn't work because the family didn't need her to, but nowadays with inflation, and a whole bunch of single mums like myself, it's difficult. We have no choice but to be independent women, whether we want to or not. Having said that, I think I'm coping just fine. I don't hate men, and I don't hate myself. So, let's keep going. Onwards and upwards. Lily to the moon. I used to do food deliveries with the company that I worked for and found through Craigslist. When I first started working with them, I was 17. They paid me next to nothing, but to me back then, even shillings, pennies, scrubs, or whatever you want to call it, that was something. It all started when I realised I couldn't afford anything. 
Going out to the movies with my friends, I couldn't even afford sweets. I couldn't afford chips. I couldn't afford chocolate. And I by sure couldn't afford any type of soda. My parents had always worked full time, but for some weird reason, they had this ethos growing up. I had to earn everything of my own to buy things that I wanted. Now granted they put food on the table, a roof over my head, clean clothes, and of course, water. But anything else, that was down to me. To be honest with you, I think this was mostly my father's decision. As I could tell at times, my mum just felt sorry for me, having to go through all of this boredom, knowing that I'd have to stay home while my friends were going out to the movies, going to the skate park, or going to the mall. I couldn't buy anything, and if I wanted to go with them, I'd just have to stand there like an idiot, buying nothing. I decided to stay home, and as a result, I started to become distant from my friends. When I turned 15 it got real bad. That's when puberty started to hit me, hormones started to kick in, and I said, hello, I'd like a girlfriend. But I couldn't do anything. I'm not saying that money's the only thing that attracts a girlfriend, like some of you guys reading this will try and say. Don't twist my words. What I'm trying to say is that you can't really do anything if you have zero money. Most guys 14 or 15 still get some money from their parents, whether it's because they get pocket change, do chores, or they just ask their parents for 10 or 20 bucks to go out with their friends or girlfriend. My dad was severely strict and wouldn't allow any of it, so I figured there's no point begging, crying and asking, as that would get me in nowhere and most likely just end up getting me grounded. Searching for odd jobs was boring, it was strenuous and it wasn't really something I wanted to do, but I had to weigh it off. What would I rather, sit like this until I'm 18 with no money until I can get a real job or go out and work some shitty job and actually then be able to get a girlfriend and go out with my friends and enjoy my childhood, especially during my mid-teens, the so-called era or golden era of a young lad's life. I made the decision that I was going to now get my bike and cycle around delivering stuff. Well, I'll be honest, it wasn't really an active decision, it was something I stumbled across on Craigslist. If I remember rightly, the job itself didn't have an age limit. In other words, you could be 120 or 1. Well obviously, it probably had a cap off at 15 or 16, but at the time, I was 17, as now we're going to fast forward 2 years. When I started the job, I really got on with the people. The restaurant workers were kind, understanding and pretty helpful. I think they got the vibe that my parents were extremely strict, as once my dad called up, and started screaming at me down the phone line because I had left their bedroom door open. Yeah, pretty mad, but I still love him. On the deliveries, I get to know familiar faces. We had Pam, the lady whose husband passed away when she was 70. She's now 83 and has been ordering the same pastrami pasta for the past four years. Yep, she orders it every single night. I have no idea how she can afford to just fork out 30 bucks every single night. I don't know why. I guess she likes it that much. And if she's got the money, well, she's good. She gave me tips every time. She was my favourite customer by far. One time, I turned up at Pam's house and she offered to give me double the tip just because it was my birthday. How did she know? Well, I was wearing one of those stupid badges they stick on your... Yeah, that's right your stupid velvet jacket that they make you wear while doing the rounds. The people at the restaurant really loved me. They took me in and treated me like some of their own family. But there was one thing that happened to me during deliveries. It was the reason I stopped. When I went down a lane once, it was dark, coming to the end of my shift at around 9pm or maybe a little before. I noticed a figure up ahead. It was just a guy leaning up against one of the walls, he looked like he was either drunk or suffering some type of a heart attack, about to collapse. As I cycled slower towards him, I didn't really know what to expect. I just maintained my speed and kind of hoped for the best. 
As I'm about to cycle past him, all of a sudden he turns from leaning on the wall, pivots his weight towards me, and grabs and slams my whole body onto the ground. Having my back slammed into the sidewalk left me pretty much unable to walk for a whole two weeks. He fractured a whole bunch of my bones, and I felt paralysed. He took the money, stole the person's pizza, and ran off. Hey guys, I hope you enjoy tonight's stories. We are in a battle with the AI story channels. Those of us who are legit story channels, we tell stories with our real voices. No AI. We are in a battle against these automations and these AI channels that are run by companies and multi-multi-millionaires that are trying to basically destroy the niche in my opinion. So I figured that I wanted to come together and kind of rally the troops. Please be careful who you listen to in the horror story niche. Make sure it's a real human voice and not someone just uh, using AI and also stealing stories off Reddit. So I really encourage you guys to pick channels like mine that don't steal stories and also put hours of work in a day making the content and making it original because I'm getting fed up of a lot of these big AI channels stealing the viewers from channels like mine. It's starting to annoy me because I think they are just really uh, taking over and it's worrying me. So other than that, I hope you enjoyed these videos. Please like every single video. Please subscribe if you are new and make sure you click that bell icon next to the red subscribe button. What the bell icon does is it sends you a notification on your phone on your iPad, your tablet, any device other than your computer, it says, oh look, Slessler uploaded, you can go watch his video. Whereas if you only click the red subscribe button, you have to manually go into your subscriptions and check when I uploaded. So basically that way you will never miss an upload. So next, uh, just comment on about the uh, commenting. I have been getting around 50 comments a video lately. Uh, I really do appreciate the comments of advice, criticism about the people in the stories, and uh, also a lot of support from you guys, which uh, means a lot to me. I put a lot of work into this channel, and I must admit, it's very difficult, you know, talking for basically an hour straight every day. Um, I do tend to lose my voice at the end of it, but I'd enjoy it, so <laughs> I'm willing to do that. You know, I like how a lot of you guys uh, just uh, comment about my voice, how you like it, how I'm original, I don't use AI. And another, another thing you guys will comment on is, I use stories that you've never heard before. Okay, and the reason that I do that is because my stories are original. I don't steal stories off of Reddit forums like the AI channels do. So, yeah, I hope to uh, see you around. And if you're new here, this is your first video on my channel, then welcome to the channel. I'm one of the good guys, and uh, I hope to see you in tomorrow's upload. Peace out.